All right. What's up, y'all? Welcome to What the Fuck is Happening with the Fed Again. Uh, I'm here with Christian, it's your boy Colin. What's good, Christian? It's going good, man. Uh, 12 days till the halving. It's, it's getting fucking real in a world it of quantitative easing. Bitcoin is tightening. It's awesome. Bitcoin ripping, man. Major assets all, you know, rallying yesterday. But Bitcoin, like, literally outdoing all of them by a factor of at least five, mostly. Yeah, like S&P was up too. You flexing. S&P was up like 2%. Bitcoin up 12%. Okay, baby. It's cooling off now, which I'm kind of happy with. I didn't want to see it rip. I'm still trying to get those cheap sats, baby. Some people sell the top. I just don't buy the top. And as soon as it comes back, I keep buying it again. So not yeah. buying is my version of selling. Right on, man. Well, we have a great show for you guys today. Uh, but let's get business done first with our sponsors. First up is Swan Bitcoin. Swan Bitcoin is the best place to get low fee Bitcoin. And you can automatically dollar cost average set up your amount for a weekly buy, daily buy, uh, monthly buy, whatever you want. It's extremely customizable. And uh, they look, uh, they do delayed settlement on your Bitcoin so you can get the cheapest fees on the market. Highly recommend you check them out. Check out swanbitcoin.com. And yeah, go hit them up, guys. Next, if you are more of a trader, less fiscally responsive than those sat stackers using Swan, you can go to eToro.com to satisfy your uh, your need to trade. But eToro is the best place to trade. They have every kind of trading feature you would want in the cryptocurrency market. You can buy and stack your Bitcoin on eToro, or you can go do some elaborate index fund investing or uh, you can even copy a active traders copying or an active traders trading strategy. So they really offer every single tool you can imagine to be in crypto and actively trade. Check out eToro at eToro.com. Or if you want that cypherpunk grind, you can download BISC, run your own instance and trade with Bitcoin's only true decentralized exchange or decentralized ordering book, whatever your semantics are. You know, uh, but BISC is really cool. Uh, Christians use it. I've used it. Great way to take, uh, you know, your trading into your own hands, become even more self sovereign. Uh, it's run over tour. You get to make uh, direct peer to peer trades with a bunch of people all over the world. They have a bunch of different payment options like Zelle, checks, cash in the mail. I mean, it's, it's wild, y'all. Go check it out, BISC.com. You didn't say this at the beginning, but we had Andy Ebstrom on the podcast, and he is a CFA and now the head of institution at Swan Bitcoin, one of our sponsors. Um, and this was a really fantastic conversation. Yeah, Andy's got a really cool, um, like you were saying, just a good background for Bitcoin. I was telling him at the end of the show, it's good that he's kind of got the CFA background, traditional finance type guy, because uh, you know, it's, it's good to have those dudes in the industry, especially when you got a lot of like long haired hippie types like me ranting about toppling the government with Bitcoin. Um, he's got really cool theses on intergenerational tension as a result of the Fed's monetary policy. Um, we talk a lot about uh, housing prices, uh, education, cost of college, all that good stuff. We also talk about uh, short term deflation and why uh, Andy, unlike Ansel, like uh, our guest for last week, thinks that the deflation isn't going to last very long and that inflation won't be soon behind or won't be too far behind. So excited to show it to you guys and let's just uh, dig right in. What's up y'all. Welcome to the next episode of what the fuck is happening with the fed. I'm your host, Colin Harper. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Andy Edstrom. Uh, a CFA by trade, but with a new job title actually coming fresh out the box. Uh, I think this is a, you're kind of going public with it, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, great to be with you, Colin. Um, uh, yesterday, it was announced that I would be uh, taking on the mantle of head of institutional for Swan Bitcoin. Uh, Swan is the one and only Bitcoin company that I have invested in. And uh, I can't imagine, you know, a company that's more aligned with my vision of the world as it relates to Bitcoin, helping people uh, stack sats, um, DCA, dollar cost average over time. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty psyched to, uh, to have joined the team in a, in a formal role. You know, I was already an investor, 
but uh, I'm psyched about uh, the opportunity to do my small part to uh, being, uh, bring Bitcoin stat sacking to the masses. Heck yeah, man. And congratulations. Uh, beginning to work in Bitcoin is awesome. Uh, and uh, as all y'all know, uh, Swan Bitcoin is a sponsor of the podcast. And uh, I, we love the service. Low fees, auto dollar cost averaging, um, beats, you know, Coinbase and Cash App. Uh, so great place to stack. Y'all should check them out. Uh, check out Swan Bitcoin. And uh, you should also check out uh, Give Bitcoin too, if you want to give people the gift of Bitcoin and explain to them what it is. I've used that for some people. Highly recommend it. Um, but uh, swans aside, maybe uh, or white swans aside and Bitcoin swans aside, maybe we should get to the the black swan that is the macro economy. And uh, we chatted a little bit before um, we you know, started recording the podcast. And uh, you're really big on this thesis of uh, how Fed and central banking monetary policy, and especially this kind of like chimera or the beginning of MMT with the blending of fiscal and monetary policy is going to drive intergenerational conflict. Uh, So I think that's really a great place to kind of uh, serve as a springboard for our conversation. what do you view as being the driver of this intergenerational conflict and what does that look like? How are we seeing this play out? Yeah, absolutely. So there's several factors, several angles, I would say, and uh, I hope you'll humor me a little bit, but I'm going to read just a couple paragraphs from my book because this is straight on point. So this is a fictional conversation that I have with my little brother who is real Uh, He's in his low 30s. Um, He's a doctor in Boston. And the conversation goes something like this. So I say, great news, brother. Low interest rates have helped reduce your housing cost of living, right? Because rents are cheaper. And he says, yeah, but I don't want to rent for the rest of my life. I want to buy my own house so I can raise a family. So I say, oh, no problem, bro. Mortgage rates are lower so you can afford the same mortgage payment as people did 30 years ago when houses were much cheaper. And he says, yeah, but those low interest rates have raised home prices so rapidly that now I have to scrape together 200 grand of cash just for the 20% down payment on a starter house in a major U.S. city. So despite being a doctor with higher income than most people my age, it would still take me years to accumulate that down payment. And that's if I wasn't saddled with student loans. And so I say, well, good point, but at least you'll uh, be well provided for in retirement, uh, you know, due to the fully funded social security and Medicare programs. Ha ha, right? So this, this encapsulates it in a nut, right? So right. Social Security and Medicare, as we've all known for literally decades, uh, are bankrupt, right? They're unfunded. There are literally a couple hundred billion dollars of unfunded liabilities. So the younger generations are still paying into that system, and they have no hope of, of, of recovering uh, you know, that, in, that quote-unquote investment. So that's one. And then two is... Yeah, interest rates are lower, but that gets fully capitalized in, in the cost of housing. And so even though your mortgage payment might have been the same today as it was 30 years ago, you got to stump up twice as much down payment you know, to afford that house. And then I add on the fact that the millennial generation has now experienced two major economic downturns and financial crises, right? We had the one, global financial crisis 2008 and 2009, and now we've got this one. And the research says that going through that at a formative time in your career, essentially earlier in your career, permanently impairs your economic prospects basically for the rest of your life. Um, and look, you know, heart, the hardest working, most talented millennials will still hustle and they'll still make stuff happen. But when you look at the entire age group, um, you see that uh, you know it's just it's it's just a, it's just a painful time basically to have come of age uh, relative to, you know, modern U.S. history. And then I fold into that sort of the other side of it. Now, by the way, I think the millennials in general, I'm generalizing, are starting to figure this out. And obviously what's going on lately has just shown a spotlight on it. But the other, you know, the other side of it is, you know, what what are the boomers thinking or what are the older generations thinking? And I just had this conversation with one of my family members. I won't call out specifically who it was. And we were talking, you know, we were debating and, and I said to him, I was like, look, it's not clear that all this debt that we're incurring at the government level and all this money we're spending to support the economy right now, it's not clear that it's worth it. 
uh, especially, you know, with respect to how the dollars get allocated, um, as well as who benefits and who pays. And his response was, well, you know, and, and specifically, I said, well, look, it's not clear, if, you know, if it's worth it to spend all this money for the benefit of the older generations, who are the ones who are likely to die, right? They're far more likely to, to get taken out by the coronavirus. Um, and his retort was, well, of the $2.2 trillion, trillion uh, in the CARES Act, that was the first round, you know, only $100 billion or whatever is going to health care expenditures. And this is, this is the misunderstanding, right? The point is not that we're spending, you know, $100 billion more on health care right now. The point is that we're incurring literally trillions of dollars at the government level, which the older generations, you know, aren't going to pay back because they will have passed away before that bill comes due. And that's just going to fall on the shoulders of the, of the younger generation. So that's a bit of a rant, but that's sort of some recent, uh, you know, some recent color. And we can get into more detail on, you know, on how the dollars shake out. But, but that's where I'll leave it. Well, there is a short sightedness in terms of the consequences, right? It's, it's, it's a generational consequence that supersedes their own lifetime. So a multi-generational consequence, truly. Um, and, and without getting into the, to, to, to climate science, it's something else that I've, I've had conversations with my dad about in terms of, you know, let's assume that the climate science is right for a second. You know, some of the boomers don't care about it as much because it's not going to affect them. Right. And, um, you know, I, I don't want to get in a debate with, with anyone necessarily right now about the, the merits of modern climate science, because I know a lot of Bitcoiners who, who have some who have, who have some things to say about narratives. Yeah. Uh, but but to your point. As a millennial myself, you know, man, I've I've seen uh, I've seen the housing uh, market really pop off, especially in Nashville where I live, where it's been exacerbated by a booming city, and um, the houses that you, I mean, seriously, man, you're seeing houses that five years ago were seventy thousand dollars, and now they're selling for two hundred two hundred fifty. I mean, and, wow. and you see stuff like that all across uh, some of these cities like Austin. Um, other ones, like I mean, you know, the big ones like Chicago, New York, and all of that, they were always, uh, but but like you were saying, everything's booming. Yeah, and absolutely, and it just it just makes, I mean, it just sets you back. I mean, everybody's uh, personal situation is different, obviously, but you know, scraping together the cash to make the down payment on a house has never been, uh, it's never been harder. And now, you know, I'm imagining, you know, twenty somethings all over the place who are out of work. And, uh, you know, hopefully they're getting, you know, they're getting a check from the government, but that doesn't, you know, that doesn't basically fill the gap. It, number one, in terms of actual cash that's needed, uh, you know, to run a household. And number two, in terms of just lost, you know, experience, um, you know, that's For just sure. something that's hard to come back from. And, and, and yeah, and you have, a, you have a generation of kids basically wasting equity or what could be equity potentially mm -hmm. in a house because they have to pay it on rent because they don't have uh, the, the upfront capital to stake to finally get equity in something. And going back to one of your points about uh, what you were saying to your brother uh, in, a, in a hypothetical conversation or a very real conversation that yeah. was then turned into a hypothetical, okay. right. uh, which really is, 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 I think, a great little encapsulation of, of the problem. Um, the, the easy credit lines have inflated many other markets, including healthcare and education. Um, as well, you know, people talk about the cost of goods, certain goods, obviously, like basic consumer goods and electronics have actually been deflated in prices over the years. Yep. The really critical ones um, haven't. And you're seeing and that's why a lot of millennials are pissed off and st straddled with student loans as well. And I think that that's contributing to some of that intergenerational tension. Absolutely. Uh, and what's interesting, again, I, I write about this in some detail in my book is so the ones you mentioned are, are the crucial ones. And healthcare, I'll sort of set aside for the moment because that it's market super is complicated. Yeah. Super complicated. <laughs> so uniquely dysfunctional for various mm. reasons that that's mm. a whole discussion in itself. But if I look at the other two, you mentioned that's housing, which we talked about, and then it's education. What's interesting about those two things is they're both mainly capital goods or partly capital goods. So if we take the, you know, the Mises, uh, Austrian categorization of goods, right? Uh, capital goods, consumption goods, monetary goods. Mm. And if you print more of the monetary good, then it flows into the capital goods and the consumption goods. Well, anything that's part capital good has seen its price go way up and that's housing and it's education, right? Because really education, you know, if you study the right stuff, which people attempt to do, they don't always succeed, at least in terms of an economic, you know, return, 
it's you know, noble it's and an good. To, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's okay to study stuff that doesn't have an economic return, but you know, for the most part, if it's an investment, then yeah, that's effectively capital good. And so any capital good has been, you know, huge, has had this huge pressure upward in, uh, in price. And that includes both housing and uh, education, in my view. Yeah, and something that you can see, it has these auxiliary effects too that people don't really see as being inflation because they can't necessarily be measured in dollars and cents. But like, so part of the thing driving tuition costs has been administra administration bloat in colleges. Um, another thing that has also been driving it has been uh, major bloat, mm -hmm. um, especially, and you see this in liberal arts colleges as well. They want to drive tuition. So they have a lot of very obscure majors that kids can't get anywhere else. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, part of what you have with this too is, you know, once you were saying, once you flood the monetary base, you then flood the capital markets. And if one of these capital markets is education, one of the side effects of this is this kind of educational inflation where you have too many, um, new, uh, you know, too many, too much new talent in the market. Uh, yep. And there aren't enough job prospects to keep up with the people being flushed through. And you have bloat in terms of what people are studying. So suddenly you have kids paying $50,000 a year to go to a liberal arts college and they end up being a barista or a bartender. Yeah. Right. It, it's a, it's a big, it's a big problem. I mean, the, it was, what's interesting and this gets into sort of, you know, bigger questions of what does the economy look like or what did it look like, you know, in past decades, what's it look like today and sort of how is it evolving? There definitely was a period of time in which, and, and this is how I was raised also, by the way, it was, you know, go to a good college, achieve a degree, work hard, you know, pick a profession. And what, and once you get sort of into the profession and, you know, credentialized therein, like everything should be okay, basically. Right. Upwards mobility. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that model, you know, worked maybe for some sub segment of the population, but not everybody uh, can do it. And, yeah, it became this mantra of don't think about it in terms of a rate of return or, or as a, you know, a financial investment. Just assume that investing in education pays a dividend and it's worth it. And so, you know, just keep your head down, go get the college degree and as you say, whatever major, and you'll be fine. But as you know, the harsh reality of the outcome is that you're not always fine. And a lot of those, yeah, a lot of that time and money spent on uh, on education was uh, well did not have a financial return, and then you layer on top of that the whole you know for profit college you know phenomenon. Where this is another stat I have in my book is I think it's the six year graduation rate, right? Not four year graduation rate, but six year under undergraduate graduation rate is like thirty percent at you know for profit colleges, right? So it's like a third, two thirds of the class never graduate. They pay tuition, they incur debt, and usually they don't even get a degree in a reasonable amount of time. And as you say, even if they get the degree, you know, it's oftentimes not marketable. So it's a, it's a, it's no, a huge bummer. It, yeah, it is a huge bummer. And then uh, really what a lot of it is too, especially with those liberal arts majors, um, you know, I was an English major. I was very thankful to be able to monetize that into something that was uh, editorial, right? Yeah. Um, but some of these kids, you know, you get a liberal arts major and then the next step is you have to get a master's. Well, I'm really worried that if I have kids, they're going to have to get a PhD to teach high school English. You know, <laughs> like, like, I feel like that's eventually like the, the, the end, like the end game of all of this is credentialism. Like, I mean, at this point, you know, when I was trying to enter the job market, entry level jobs, I needed two years experience. Yep. And I was like, I mean, I eschewed internships in college because I needed to make money too. Yeah. Like I, I couldn't, I couldn't do editorial internships. I needed to go be, be a server so that I could make cash to hang out with my friends. Totally, man. You got to earn your beer money or a lot of people, a lot of people are paying for tuition, right? And tuition's higher. Tuition levels are higher than they've yeah. ever been. So anybody, you know, who has to sort of pay their way. Uh, yeah. It's then they can't get on the career ladder, quote unquote, right. Cause they can't get the right internship early enough, you know, which prevents them to get, you know, from, or makes them less competitive in getting, you know, the optimal job right out and yeah it just all snowballs yeah and um i'm glad right things have worked out for you though you're on uh, you're on the right side of uh you're on the right side of things
Uh, that's what I'm trying to tell all my buddies too. I mean, some of my, like one of them, he's, he's a perfect textbook example of this. Uh, really industrious, smart guy, like critical thinker, really good at self-study, but he hated school. Mm. But his parents just kept pushing him and pushing him and said, you got to get a four-year degree. But the dude is really good at like learning on the go. He's learned how to, he, he bought a van, fixed it up. He's an arborist by trade. Uh, he, he, he does uh, other carpentry and things like that. Mm-hmm. and uh you know sounds like a handy guy yeah man and he would have just been better being going to like you know a trade school or something where he could have done that instead of having to incur all this debt going to a school that he didn't really you know he got a lot of social benefits out of it and uh, a lot of friends but yeah. um the, the, the practical education is is just not not there and um and you see it in so many levels of education you, how many you know i never had a, ba- a basic civics class economics class or just like a a class on what I could expect when I got out of college, you know, here's how you do your taxes, any of that stuff. Yeah. I had, so I had the same experience. I, I took a liberal arts degree, although I, I did study economics. <clears throat> I basically, I did an econ degree. I studied a lot of psych and I studied a lot of math. And, but even within the econ degree, first of all, it was a hundred percent Keynesian, right? Yeah. No, just like <laughs> no mention of the Austrians. Like they never existed. Not a thing. Which which prepared me very poorly, right, for understanding Bitcoin, mm. um, or even understanding gold, for that matter. Mm. Um, so so there was that, and then yeah, as you say, um, very little or no practical experience, and really, you know, in my opinion, that should be pushed down even you know to the to the high school level, right? I mean, basic financial education. It it does make you wonder about whether it's not by design, right? It makes you wonder if if the you powers sound that crazy. be aren't. Yeah, yeah, you sound crazy, and people call you a conspiracist. <laughs> but like, why wouldn't we teach children basic, you know, good money sense? The, the only logical conclusion is that they want you to spend money at a rapid rate, so that you can't actually, you know, so that you can't actually keep any of it. All right, so. We've got all of this, like, you know, educational inflation and uh, the credit markets ramping up asset prices across real estate, uh, education, healthcare, all that stuff. Um, but for our episode last week, we had with Ansel, uh, you know, we're really in a period of deflation right now, right? Oil futures just went negative, prices are dropping, no one's really, nothing's stimulating the economy. Uh, so I kind of want to get your take on short term what we can, ex- what you think we're going to experience. And also kind of what the end game of this intergenerational conflict is and the Fed's monetary policy right now. Yeah. So, of course, you know, it's risky to, to give exact time frames and, you know, try to estimate how it all plays out. Because we're literally in unprecedented, you know, times and on, you know, untested ground. But I'll give it my best shot. And by the way, you know, I've, I've had this debate with Ansel actually recently on the, on the Swan Signal, uh, you know, podcast in detail, but, but in a nutshell, the way I see it is, yes, short-term deflationary, huge demand shock where if you're, you know, if the average person is stuck indoors, you know, then they're not spending on stuff. And then as you pointed out, you know, anything transportation related, you know, commodities stuff, you know, huge decrease in price. And so the question is, how long does that last? And obviously, the Fed and other central banks are printing literally infinite, you know, unbounded amounts of money to counteract this deflationary force. Um, my view is that they will succeed uh, <laughs> eventually. And the question is, how long does it take? So I don't know how long the pandemic is going to last. I really just don't know. Like, how quickly can we open the economy? You know, is it sort of stop start? You know, which of the therapeutic um, you know treatments work and which don't? When do we get a vaccine? Do we get a vaccine? You know, do people you know actually abide by the rules or the norms? You know, of uh, of keeping a lid on this thing. So I don't know how long it takes. But let's say whatever it takes to get past the pandemic. So then the question is, how long until inflation? I think we have to acknowledge that the Fed has put in writing, okay, in recent FOMC statements, they've been talking about how the inflation target is quote unquote symmetric. What that means is, according to their measurements, which, you know, we can debate, but according to their measurements, they've been undershooting the inflation target already for years. So they've said, look, uh, it'd be okay if we overshoot for a while. Number one. Number two, they, you know, they've said literally there's no limit on how much money we can print. 
So that all tells me that ultimately we get to inflation. You know, I before the crisis would have said it probably you know could take a decade. Now I don't think it will. You know, I think it's more like five years. Although others, you know, think it it could take longer. The thing we don't know about is there's the whole human psychology element, right? So far, the velocity of money has been quite slow, or been quite low and falling since the financial crisis. And so the question is, how long do people hoard dollars? Excuse me, or other fiat? And a quick, quick cut, cutting in really quickly. Yeah. Can you, uh, for some of our listeners, just give a brief like explanation of what you mean by velocity of money? Yeah, exactly. That's that's the whole um, the monetary equation, uh, money. Quantity times velocity equals price times quantity, uh, and bi- basically what it means is GDP or you know total activity in, a, in an economy um, equals the amount of money times the velocity because GDP is based on actual transactions that occur, and the total amount of transactions that occur since half of every transaction is a monetary transaction is the amount of money you know times the number of times that that dollar let's say gets spent. And the velocity, so that's the equation. And the velocity has gone down since the global financial crisis. Um, and what's interesting about that is we don't really know what drives monetary velocity. Um, and largely it's psychological. I might think. be an idiot when it comes to <laughs> economics, but. Well, so are I, the economists, it turns out. <laughs> well, I would have thought the velocity would increase if liquidity is easy. Because yeah. shouldn't I guess that's where the Cantillian effect comes in, right? Like, well, like I think concentrated in the upper echelon of, of of society, right? I definitely agree that that's a factor. Which is, yes, if most of the newly printed money, as you say, through the Cantillian effect, flows to the rich on average, and the rich tend to spend a lower portion of their total assets or their total income, you know, than than everybody else. Then yes, that I I agree reduces the velocity. Um, I think also you know part of it the psychological element is just like you know how likely am I to hold on to dollars? I'll speak for myself. Okay, lately, so like lately, what have I been doing with my income? Uh, I'm not going out and buying a bunch of stuff. I'm still dollar cost averaging my Bitcoin, right? I'm still accumulating. But you know, if you ask me like what do I want to hoard right now, the answer is dollars. Right. I am, you know, nervous about the long term economic effects of this pandemic. And I think I'm probably not the only one, especially considering that, you know, I still have a job. I mean, yes, you know, my income will probably be reduced, you know, due to, you know, assets uh, being down. And that's, you know, the nature of how I make money. But, you know, I'm relatively lucky. You know, I still got a job. I'm not out of a job. I think the average person out there is probably nervous and they're less likely to spend those dollars that they're taking in and they're more likely uh, to hoard them. But, but the psychology element is, is when is there an inflection point and when does that change and what might cause the change? Well, one thing that might cause the change is more and more headlines about the government printing more and more dollars, as well as, you know, every day that goes by, let's say with Bitcoin that it, you know, doesn't fail basically uh, it gains mind share and people start, you know, continue asking, oh, this, you know, this thing's been around, you know, 10 years and 11 years and 12 years and why hasn't it failed and what's going on here? Um, so, and then human psychology in terms of the herd, you know, the masses can turn, you know, almost on a dime. I mean, hit- history is littered with examples of governments, you know, oppressive governments that were all dominant, all powerful until some event occurs and then, you know, public perception shifts and all of a sudden something that was there before uh, isn't the emperor's people realize the emperor has no clothes and you get a shift. So the, now the counter argument that probably Ansel and others would make is, well, look at Japan, right? Japan, you know, has even more debt than we do and they just keep printing money and they're still stuck in deflation. And my counter argument to that is number one, Japan is different than the U S right. They got worse demographics they are a much more homogeneous society, right? They all sort of pull in the same direction. And number three is most of the government bonds are actually owned by Japanese citizens. So there's not that, uh, that uh, risk of the, the debt market sort of falling apart. But the second thing to consider is just because they got, you know, to three, whatever, to, to government jet, debt to GDP of over 300% doesn't mean that we'll get there. 
And it also doesn't mean that, you know, there's some like bright line where 300% of GDP is okay, but 301%, you know, is too much. And, uh, and oh, if they got to 301%, well, then we can get there too. No, if, some, if at some point, you know, the Japanese uh, government bond market, you know, starts to, to show stress, then everybody else in every other financial market is going to be looking around and saying, oh, well, maybe the U.S. can't borrow infinitely. And therefore, maybe there is credit risk. And therefore, maybe I don't want to hold so many dollars. And therefore, you know, people start spending those dollars, getting rid of them, and the velocity goes up, and that's when you risk inflation. So that's... Nice. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, look, that's, and so then the question is when, and we don't know. I mean, I wish, you know, some will say that we'll live in this deflationary funk for another decade or two. I've heard, I, I heard an interview, I can't remember on some other podcast uh, about a, a investment manager who was talking about how, you know, talking about how the great inflation will come, but it'll be his grandkids that have to deal with it, right? Like decades and decades from now. And I don't know, I mean, I, I don't see it taking that long. Well, I think, yeah, people's time horizons are all screwed up, but like, let's just think about how quickly things have escalated. You know, 2020 was all fine and well, and then Trump yeah. started taking COVID seriously, and then America shut down, and then Republicans are sending out UBI. You know, <laughs> Isn't it took, it amazing? It, yeah, it took one <laughs> month for a Republican president to give people free money, like to literally become a socialist. And so people, like you were saying, uh, psychologies can change very quickly, especially when people feel threatened. And for one of the things that I think you were pointing out too, it's like people were like, oh, it's been around for 11 years. It's been around for 12 years. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin is all about people's risk appetite. Once it stops seeming so risky, that's going to really change people's minds. And it's starting to, like I said, my friends, they're starting to not see it as a, uh, one of my friends said, the one who uh, is really crafty and um, <laughs> we were talking about, he said, yeah. um, I was talking to him about Bitcoin and red pulling him one day and he said, get me off this hot air balloon. So I think, I think, you know, I think people will start having similar thoughts, especially, you know, since inflation could not be very far away. I like that, dude. You got to meme that if you haven't already, uh, get, get me off this hot air balloon, the fiat, <laughs> the fiat hot air balloon. Hell yeah, brother. Um, well, Andy, uh, is there anything else that we didn't touch on that you wanted to kind of get out in this episode? I've been really enjoying it. I mean, you, you've got some great points. I think you really boiled down a lot of these topics pretty well. Pleasure's mine, Colin. Um, you know, obviously there's so many levels to this and, you know, I, I have a view and, you know, there's a lot of ways it could, it could play out. But for me, all, you know, all roads lead to inflation and hopefully to Bitcoin. Um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm doing my part and I'll, I'll shill, you know, Swan Bitcoin, which is, you know, an on-ramp for uh, auto dollar cost averaging. And then, you know, of course, I'll show my book. Uh, it's called Why Buy Bitcoin? Uh, Investing Today in the Money at Tomorrow. It's on Amazon. Um, you know, follow me on Twitter. My handle's Edstrom Andrew. And um, I have a personal website with other, you know, podcast appearances and stuff. And that's andyedstrom.com. Heck yeah, man. Uh, cool. Thanks. We'll, we'll keep up the good work, uh, uh, Colin. I, we really got to keep working to figure, tell people uh, WTF uh, happened and is going on. And, uh, you know, you guys are, uh, are bringing good word uh, to people. So keep it up. We're trying to, man. Thank you. We appreciate having guys like you, especially like, I don't know, dudes like a CFA or just like some legacy uh, econ guy really getting plugged into Bitcoin. It, it helps because it makes, you know, the, the dirty hippies like me look a little less crazy. It's so, great, man. I'm the I'm the dirtier. I come from the dark. I, I was born and raised on the dark side of finance. Uh, you know, I've been a I've been a I've been a financial rent seeker pretty much my entire career. So, uh, you know, we're all going to wake up to it at one time or another, and we're all doing our part to uh, to bring it to everyone. Hell yeah, man. Well, thanks for coming on. Take it easy and stay well with all this craziness, huh? You too, man. A quick reminder that all of the content in this episode is for informational and entertainment purposes only. You should not construe the information as legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. Nothing contained in this presentation constitutes a solicitation, recommendation, or offer by BTC Media, the Let's Talk Bitcoin Podcast Network, or any third-party service provider to buy or sell securities or any other financial instruments. Do your own research. Mm -hmm.